It's a place for soldiers to put their story to music. I was told that I would never walk again, ever. Tell me something like when you were all the way down. When I hit rock bottom, I saw the light. That's when I knew I could win this fight. It, it's our way to say, America, we need to wake up. We, we have an entire generation of, of hardwired military personnel that are going to need some assistance. It's my biggest failure. My brothers lifted to the heavens as the rovers wailed. Would have called me a hero. Feel like I failed. I can't uh, use it as an excuse to not live. Pull myself out of the wheelchair. I felt like uh, you said it. You like I, I thought I was fly. I thought I was fly. I thought I could fly. Thought I could fly. Let me see that chorus. So, tell me about this. So have you ever been alone? Through my deployments, I've heard t rockets, tons of rockets and mortars and everything. You know, you can, you, they, they have a distinct sound, so you know when to hit the dirt. And this sound, it, it was a really weird sound. Uh, I asked the first time, I said, what is that noise? And he goes, I don't know, it sounds like a flying lawnmower. And we kind of chuckled a little bit. And then, and then it hit, and it was loud. Everybody was running everywhere. We were grabbing our gear. You know, the sirens were going off, and and we jumped and landed into and dug over into the bunker. All, both of us did. That's when I hurt my back. About two hours, three hours later, my feet started going numb. Then my legs, my calves, and my thighs. And I told my platoon sergeant, you know, I was like, man, I, I can't, I can't feel my legs. Within an hour, I was packed and medevaced out. I can cry. I was alone. For four deployments, even in between deployments, being back home, you got this camaraderie with your friends and even your soldiers. And I was alone. I didn't know anybody. Every hospital, people were poking and tugging and sticking me with needles and giving me medicine. I didn't know all these people, you know. time in my life. Tell me something like when you were all the way down. I just walked to the, into the closet and I just collapsed onto my knees. And I balled my blanket up and I just held onto my blanket and I just laid my head on my blanket and, I, and that's where I went to sleep. I've been all the way down. I felt my knees on the ground. That's when I have you ever seen the light? My brother, I have. You like that? I've been all the way Kenny's down. a trip. We wrote a song yesterday. Uh, he and Radney Foster and I wrote a song. And uh, he'd never written anything before that. He'd never heard his words. He'd never heard his thoughts put onto paper. And last night he wrote six pages of lyrics of his story of, 
of being uh, wounded, evacuated, depression, and healing. Six pages. And what's amazing is that yesterday Kenny wasn't a writer, and today he's a writer. Get through this fight together. I was told that I would never walk again, ever. Well, I had three crushed vertebrae, yeah, had three, and had nerve damage, like severe nerve damage. After surgery, it was just downhill. I went downhill, you know, I mean, I, I was such a strong, strong soldier to have all that taken away from me, and it was hard. I didn't even know this is what it was gonna look like, but I'm definitely gonna challenge that peak right there. That was the hardest I've ever worked. Um, to, to learn how to walk and to, to overcome the medicines and the narcotics that they had me on. All right, you ready for this? I'm ready. Ice climbing, wow, never done it before, don't know how to do it, you know, so I was kind of nervous at first because I didn't know what to expect. There's a lot of trust that has to go into that. And, you know, going through PTSD and having these injuries, you, you kind of lose, I would say, I lost trust in people in general. And then trying to say, coming out there, maybe you met the, me or somebody a few times, and then you're like, well, I want you to climb this, and I'm going to hold you on this rope. So I have to give all my trust to that person to go, OK, you got my life in your hands. And just taking that and being able to trust someone, I think, is really helpful. Well, I was thinking to myself, what have I gotten myself into? You know, because just to walk up there was difficult. You know, I mean, there was times where it was almost vertical, going up, nothing but snow and ice and mud and dirt, and you're next to this this creek, and and you're just thinking, like, wow, what's if if it's this is as difficult as it is, what's going to happen when I get to the ice mountain? And we get there, and it's literally almost straight up and down. Pull down on it. Okay. The big thing is, once you have that, you have always three points of contact. Okay. They gave me about a five-minute class on, on how to use the picks and how to, how to put the spikes in my, that were on my boots, how to put them into the, into the ice mountain, and, and I was ready, and I did it. Dog tags on my belt. Remind me I'm still alive. I promise to my children when I kiss them goodbye. Everything that, that I do now is a challenge because they told me I would never be able to walk again. And I've proved them wrong so far. Moments later, it's the red flare that marks the spot for the rescue chopper that drops in its first medic. 
I always took pride in being the tip of the spear, you know, and, and uh, you know, fighting that main fight. We were able to be really successful at it, finding a lot of, a lot of bombs and getting evidence from those bombs, finding bad guys, you know. Let me tell you a story you never heard before. Only thing I ever was good at was war. We were securing the area to help the Afghanis uh, uh, conduct their elections out there, and uh, we fought through the night. The day before, we had been missed by eight out of nine RPGs, and the one that hit stuck in the side of my truck and didn't detonate. So we were very thankful and lucky. We were like, wow, well, you know. And I remember thinking on the way back, I was like, they're gonna have, you know, an IED for us. We need to take this slow. When it detonated, it hit the back of the truck, and that's ex that's right where uh, Matt was sitting, you know, and um, and it flipped us over, and all we saw was gray and dirt, you know, and and we couldn't even see Matt. Um, so everything inside the truck had been tossed on top of him, you know, and we pulled him out and. We laid him on the road, and there wasn't there wasn't a part of him that didn't have, you know, some some type of injury. Just like the flag tattered by the wind, the black bags fluttered from the black hawk spin. My brothers lifted to the heavens as the rotors wailed. Would have called me a hero. Feel like I failed. My biggest failure. I have it on video. It was my responsibility to find. I mean, we're trained to know um, where those things would be located, and that, that's what you would call a choke point. Faded glory. Faded glory. Faded glory. Faded glory. I do feel like I could have done things different. I could have uh, made, I had, it was on me to make the decision and tell my leadership that, hey, this is, we need to probably dismount this area. I'm gonna honor their men best I can. I'm gonna live and gonna love with all that I am. That's what I'm trying to focus on, you know, living, living for him and, and the other young men that we've lost. I know, I've, I've spoken to Matt's wife and she's living her life really well and, um, and she has forgiven me, you know. And so I can't uh, use it as an excuse to not live, you know. So this experience is a big eye opener for me. I'm happy to be here and happy to remember Sergeant Matthew Ingram. I'm not a complicated person. I'm a father and a soldier, and those are my priorities, you know. Now, how do I do those things well? Um, I've probably struggled with a little bit. So you're really talking to your son, right? Okay. When I was gone in 2003, there was a, one of my favorite songs. Um, I had like two CDs, and one of the CDs was uh, the Dixie Chicks, and the song was uh, Godspeed. It goes, dragon tails and the water is wide. Pirates sail and lost boys fly. Fish bite moonbeams every night and I love you. God's feet, little man. Sweet dreams. Uh, Radney wrote it. 
players uh, that I... Godspeed. Uh, Godspeed. Rodney Rodin. Are you serious? Yeah, really? about his boy going to France. Are you serious? No. Could you thank me later? Oh my God. Yeah, Rodney wrote that song. I sing that to my, I sing that to my son. So you, you gotta tell Rodney that. Yeah. Sweet dreams, little man. Oh, my love. Come to find out, Rodney wrote that song for uh, the Dixie Chicks. So he, he was influencing me before either one of us knew it. You know, it's amazing stuff. Music is is powerful. I sang to you when I was out on patrol. I sang the songs only you and I know. You can know that I'm trying to do all that I do all, do all I can because I'm gonna be your daddy again. Know that I'm trying not, to do it. Know that I'm trying to do all that I can to not just be a soldier, but to be your dad. Well, the song is called "Little Boy's Prayer," uh, and it's about them, you know, talking to them and them praying for me, and as they did every night. He's over there. The soldier can hear. I do respect them, and I do love their words because they speak incredibly poetic. Uh, we're not dealing with people who are unintelligent. They're extremely intelligent, and they have seen a, also they've seen a part of human the human condition. I haven't seen. Ninety nine percent of America hasn't seen. I have an amazing opportunity to be a witness to it, and to help them make an, make a thing, a thing that we can then send out into the world. What a joy. And I always wonder, son, can you hear? Cause your voice is coming through the soul. Sorry, I was thinking that earlier. I'm such a... <laughs> <laughs> this stuff just rips me out, man. Let's get out of Don't be afraid to say something. Cause your voice is coming through. To be able to write songs with these soldiers, to where you can take their story and put it into a song, um, it's a huge gift to them, back to them. It's called uh, A Little Boy's Prayer. Little boy, don't you worry, your daddy's coming home. I know you must wonder where I've been so long. I left you and your mother when you were first born. Came back so different to fight in the war. Lay your head down at night and pray. Please, Lord, bring my daddy home safe. Look down upon him while he's over there. Cause a soldier can hear a little boy's prayer. Okay, everybody, take a deep breath. <laughs> and you I sing to you when I'm out on patrol. I sing the songs only you and I know. And I'll always wonder, son, can you hear? Cause your voice is coming through loud and clear. Hey, Look down upon me while he's over there. Cause a soldier can hear a little boy's prayer. Yes, a soldier can hear a little boy's prayer. son who did three combat tours early in this war as a um, special ops with their 3rd Battalion 75th Rangers. 
night vision goggles, guys jumping out of C-130s. October of 2001, the third C-130, fifth guy in the stick, was my 18-year-old son. Six hours after he hit the ground, uh, he had his first hand-to-hand, -hand, one by half a second. Wounded in Tora Bora in, in early 2002, purportedly looking for Osama. And then in the invasion of Iraq, jumped onto the Haditha Dam, spring of 2003. He did 24 months in country. That's why I'm here, because I've seen, I have personal knowledge of what has been demanded of this generation of vets. And the bottom line is my son's in trouble. My son is typical of this generation of combat veterans who come home angry, wounded, despairing, in doing what we call the three to five years of rage. They self-medicate. They get in trouble with the law. This is a different group of, of veterans that are transitioning out of military life. We communicate different. We socialize different. And we need to transition different. Uh, this is not a military issue. This is a social issue. I want to hold America accountable. These kids went and did everything we asked them to do. So as a parent, my role, what I found is I needed to shut up and listen. focus is on uh, my son. The focus is on the hopeless feeling that you can't fix it. And that you should have understood better. You wore the uniform. Academically, you knew the issues. But because you hadn't experienced it, you had an inflated sense of your knowledge as a dad. I just wanted to death. I just wanted my boy okay. I remember the day I got it. Really got it. Really got it. I started listening. So he could rise, shine. We put it all on the line. And it finally came down to you really ain't got it. You're not much different from the civilians on the outside, and you gotta just listen. Because these young men and women, they got it. And their experience is unique to America. Whenever you fall, we call failing forward. Whenever you fail forward, you've gotta take that and, and make that something positive. What these young people have said at this camp just reinforces what I've heard when I started listening instead of just talking. You know, I see, I see a guy with a scar all around his scalp where he's been hit by shrapnel in the brain. And, and here's what I've heard, that his scar is physical and psychological and emotional 
and mental. But for my son, it's a similar scar, but I can't see it. Music Camp is our awareness piece. It is about telling the stories of this generation, post 9-11 veterans. So you might take the initiative to go out and do a little research on what it's gonna to take to employ them, to have them as your neighbors, to embrace them. They deserve it. He could rise, shine. We put it all on the line. He did what we asked him to. So the least that we can do Give him hell, give him hope Give him up, let him know He I came the first time, uh, the first uh, um, music camp that they had, but uh, I wasn't too too comfortable, um, uh, you know, ex expressing um, my thoughts, um, and so I I didn't do much. Um, I, you know, I was just there, you know, where you know the scenery, and you know, I was just pretty much doing. Uh, you know, fishing every day. <laughs> so, and this time, you know, I, I felt more comfortable um, and I, I was more relaxed. And um, so I, I just kind of felt more, um, more com compelled to, to tell my story. Now, I'm a big fly fisherman and he's, he's a fly fisherman and, and uh, you know, they thought that it'd be good to kind of kind of go out. He, he wasn't talking a lot. I mean, I was doing a lot of the talking, and that, he just was not ready to sit down and and crank everything out, you know, open. Oh my gosh! Like today, it's amazing how, what he. I mean, he's talking and opened up and 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 wrote songs this time, and and, and he's just on his way to recovery. There's one we wrote with Angel. It's it's called Angel's Wings, but it's but basically the hook is, ain't it crazy how the scream of hellfire. Sounds like angel wings. And it's a great thing when the scream of hell fire sounds just like angel's wings. It's a sweet relief. With the IED blast, um, I lost the use of the right side. Couldn't walk. I couldn't talk. My vision was damaged. And um, my memory. And like, sometimes I, I would want to give up because um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see the progress, you know? My, like my, my whole uh, rehabilitation was so slow. I know for a fact that when I started, when I started walking, you know, I felt more more free you know mm -hmm. more freedom because there it was it was just tough in the wheelchair and it was so slow i was just like you know taking one step you know another step but like once i started walking i just said well all right i'm walking this is so fascinating to me because you just said freedom that's what you're fighting for i i didn't want to go anywhere um they would be outings, maybe to the movies. Why didn't you want to go out? You just were depressed. You well, because to... I had a helmet, you know? It's like a, a white, huge helmet. And and obviously, I'm, I'm walking with a freaking cane. And, you know, I, and at that time, you know, I'm, I was like, I was 20. Mm. So I, I don't want to be a, a freaking 20 year old guy with a helmet and walking with a cane. Do you miss being out in the field? Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah you, was, what What do you miss? Just, just the, the driving. And yeah, the... it's it's just. I mean, just the driving that truck, you know. Yeah. Um, I know out there the heat sucked, 
Mm-hmm. But just being out there was just, you know, just amazing. You know, so you belonged. Yeah, it just it just felt right. You know, That's nice. being out there. Wait, you're driving. Yeah, yeah. And you see the enemy. I see the enemy, and so when uh, when I stop, uh -huh. I have my. Up. They they're you know getting off the truck. I get my my M16 and I'm shooting from your window from the window at the enemy. I'm I'm in the the back of the truck putting some armor with a lot of uh, truckers and uh, and you heard the news. Yeah, they 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 told me it's like, hey, did you hear one of the one of our guys uh, died. It's like, no, no. Mm. Who is it? It's like, I think it's uh, I own. And I was like, my 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 heart just dropped. Like I just couldn't process mm. the the information. You know, it was just like I had gone through so many things because I had you know gone through like some firefights and everything and you know, so Is I this was, your first friend? Um that I, you heard of that passed. Yeah, yeah. That was the first you know, he was he was a he was a great person. After that, um I just I wanted it I wanted to just get revenge, you know. Yeah. Even though, you know, nothing else uh like bad happened, you know, it was it was kinda like you know, It got personal. Yeah. Um I didn't really care, you know. Yeah. I I was just every every time I heard a shot or anything, I was my my head was just up, you know. There's so much to talk about, and part of that's my job to figure out how to scope it down. One of the one of the things that I miss the most is, is running. So okay, we start the song. I used to run. Mm -hmm. I, I used to dumb, I used to this and that, and I want to know what those things are, and I think about that from this chair. I used to run, now sometimes I think about the way I used to run. Boy, here, I want to do it from a place of strength, though. I want it to be your past that. Um, when I find the, the thing that, if I can narrow in on one part of this more than another part, which is the big theme of the song, it's going to dictate in my head some kind of music, and I don't even know what it is yet. I don't want to just settle on one thing right now and just write it and be done with it. I really want it to be the right song, mm -hmm. whatever your song's going to be. So I'd like to sit with this tonight, and then tomorrow we'll get back together and finish the song. And said baby steps yesterday, just a little bit at a time. And that was so inspiring to me. And I, I just thought, I'm still here. So I knew that was going to be in the song. I didn't know what else. So when that beat was going, I was like, I'm still here. And I thought that'd be a nice refrain. Good. When I met Angel, it was um, Thursday night when we first got here. And I heard his story. And he talked about how he lost his sight. And he couldn't hear. He couldn't walk. He was in a wheelchair. And he couldn't speak. And now he can do all those things amazingly. And uh, it was so funny because when he was telling us that story, he was like, you know, but I'm here, so I mean, I guess that's good. <laughs> I would say that's good. But that. And we're glad me, you are, bro. <laughs> yeah, hey, to that, man. So that inspired our song, which we call I'm Still Here. It goes like this. It's really a hip hop song. You're going to have to imagine Darden as a hip hop. It's folky <laughs> when she's doing it, it's right. hip hop when it's going to get produced. That's right. right. We'll do it right on the record. <laughs> no, you sound great doing it. Okay, great. Um, let's see. One, two, three, four. Every day I realize how lucky I am, and it ain't no lie, cause I'm still here. I think about my buddies who died, and I wonder why I swear sometimes. I'm still here. But I'm still here.
Carter Road is a well-known name, road in Iraq, and there's a lot of people that got hurt and killed on it. There's two ways out, one way's dead. You gotta have eyes in the back of your head. You know the path to perdition starts on Predator Road. We still had the IEDs and stuff, and it was just prepping, knowing that we were gonna go down this road was what the song was about. You gotta get prepped up and hyped up because you don't know. You don't know if it's your time to go. We're red and red. Got hit with the IED in my third deployment, uh, direct hit, and basically gave me TBI. And then through the rest of the deployments, kind of pushed my PTSD over a level. The headaches came in first, and they just were kept coming and coming and coming. And eventually, that led to anger, and then my memory started slipping. Fear stands up, it's quiet in the streets. A single beat of sweat starts dripping down my cheek with the gunners my car. We all hear the sound. I started drinking and then one night I had a blackout and I woke up in my garage and I was talking to myself going, talking myself out of trying to go kill my wife because I thought that's what I needed to do. We tried to steal our life, we tried to steal our soul. I can see the glow of the fob lights, boys, we've almost made it home. You hear it coming straight from them when they're you know, when they're when they're crying and you're crying and, and and you're trying to write a song in the middle of it and, and all this stuff is pouring out, all this emotion. It's it is a powerful thing. Finally I ended up spending about eighteen days in an inpatient PTSD clinic down in Pueblo and you know that kind of brought everything up to grasp. I didn't think I had these issues and I just became a lounge and sat on my couch and didn't want to do anything and didn't even want to play with my kids. Well, fortunately, my son started calling me fat and telling me I need to get in shape, so, you know, that was kind of a, a pusher to get get moving and get, so. Grew up ice climbing, rock climbing, doing all the outdoor stuff, and it's kind of just been one of my niches that I like to do. And I went on a, a, a venture race as a volunteer and helped him out and was watching paraplegics and blind people do all this crazy stuff, uh, rock climbing, mountain biking, whitewater ra rafting, and I was like, there's no way that these guys can do that, and I can't do that being fully physical capable. And after that, I just gave it 110%. I was on probably about, uh, I think at that time, about 10 different medications for PTSD, anger, headaches, back, high blood pressure. When I first was going hard at it, 
I dropped my uh, at least down to five medications at first. And then over the year and a half that I've been out, I was able to drop down to, I'm on two right now. Now I get to take people out and I make sure I have good people around me uh, and we accomplish our mission. So make sure these guys get help, get up there and have fun. songs here are heavy because it's heavy on their heart and they're you know, they're demons that they have to get out there's nothing you know that's upbeat and danceable to demons <laughs> generally and, and but and that's not why we're here but hey they like to laugh and have fun too I can't wait to get my hands on this fun flirty song about two co-workers who are trying to keep it from their colleagues in a way. We're kind of just in the mood to let loose a little bit and bob our heads, you know? Yeah, but he gets a chance to say, I can't wait to get my hands on you. Oh, then she, and then she needs to say it too. Well, she needs, some, she needs a, a fun, more discreet way of saying, yeah, you look kind of cute too, but... Boy, put away those bedroom eyes. Don't you know there are the spies all? <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty cute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so she changed her. It, it's gonna be fun, and it's especially with Georgia because I can't wait to get her in. We're all human, and and they, you know, and they've gone through some, they've gone through, they've gone through some relationships, and and uh, it was fun just kind of, kind of uh, tapping into that, and and and, and we wrote it, and we, we, kind of a fun loving song about it, you know. flight is the flight that the military call, the flights when they bring their fallen brethren home to their final resting place and to their families. And uh, this song is dedicated to seven men who lost their lives in the Texas National Guardsmen and the proceeds from this song goes to the Texas National Guard Family Support Foundation for the Guard Family Support Crisis. And, uh, it's probably been viewed on YouTube uh, well over a couple million times. Call Angel. I left to see one birdie out of four. 
Come on, brother, you with me tonight. Between heaven and earth, you're never alone. On the angel flight, come on, brother, I'm digging. Tonight this flies for another man Do what we do, cause we hear the call Some give a little, we gave all I couldn't let it be true. You guys want a beer? Can you go get one for us? That's cool. <laughs> <laughs>